Okay, hey everybody. Hey, this is our uh, Sunday night collab, cooperative lab with uh, all of us or some of us that are on the channel. We're missing Victor. But um, we started off talking about uh, Rudolf Steiner and some of his work. And um, Karen has come along a really good YouTube channel um, that has a lot of Steiner's work. And Steiner, I think, has like something like three, four hundred books, I think, on a lot of spiritual stuff. He kind of pulled. So from what I understand is that Steiner started, he was murdered, I think like in 1926, he was poisoned to death because obviously the powers that be didn't really like a lot of the conversations he was having. But he also was involved with like the Theosophy Society. And there are, you know, inklings that Madame Blavowski and a lot of these other people were also involved. Uh-oh, Lenny, I can't hear you. Alice Bailey was involved. Yeah. And uh, Steiner, Blavatsky, Walter Russell, uh, Victor Schauberger. Yeah. A lot of people who were part of that group of thinkers who are just written out of the history right now. Yeah, so there was like a whole group. They also dabbled in seance type stuff and conjured beings and there was a lot of you know talk about a lot of different stuff so most of them were highly evolved you know people in education that had doctorates but then they also were in this kind of you know period of where we had these people who were brilliant that were born on earth but also were mystics you know they also had this mystic ability or you know, Steiner calls himself that he was psychic, but he was more than psychic because he could actually direct himself into any, you know, level he needed. Hold on, I have dog fighting outside. You get in here right now. <laughs> uh, for example, one of the books on this list, and I would say that um, we will put the what it is is whole audiobooks from Rudolf Steiner, and it's a playlist of 241 videos. Is that the channel? I mean, it's what astounding that somebody has that. Um, well, I'll put the link in. The, the, it's it's not a channel. Um, the person who it's it's an actual playlist from a channel. The channel belongs to Rudolf Steiner Archive, and the name of the playlist is called whole audio books from Rudolf Steiner. It has 241 videos. And I can tell by just little timestamps that it's updated regularly. And what I do is I just bookmark it. And um, before I go to bed, I, I, I look at a computer screen all day, so I find myself gravitating towards audio books. And um, everything is, is it's good audio, good quality audio, um, good reading, not a lot of stuttering and that kind of stuff that could uh, disrupt your cognitive process. So, um, and it literally covers every topic that you could possibly ever imagine. Just, I mean, I was like, wow, this is a gold find. I mean, it's like it was like finding oh, gold on the, the Internet. Yeah, the thing is, like, that shocks me is that there's sort of a movement nowadays and there's people picking up a lot of the lectures that Steiner gave on vaccines about the future kind of a vaccines that mm -hmm. people are like blown away that, you know, how come this information didn't get out and people stopped vaccination. Right. This right. Is, like, and that and, and that's new. Right. And that's what's amazing. And I'm looking at, you know, there's all this wealth of information. And at this point, 8,707 views. I mean, that's it in a world yeah. of like 7 billion people. <laughs> like, well, but you know, I, I, people wait, don't really, yes. I mean, they got rid of him, you know, and, and because he was so brilliant. But one of the things that my teacher said at Rudolf Steiner when I was taking the biodynamic program was that. Steiner could see 500 years into the future and and when I found biodynamics it was like shamanism it was like earth alchemy shamanism you know like mm -hmm. I could craft medicines to fix the earth right um which was like unheard of and so being able to do that and so he's my teacher said it was like 
Steiner, when people would come to Steiner with a problem, he would use his, you know, science mind and his brilliance, but then he also would go out mystically and he would go out in directions and then he would see like what the earth was going to need after 2100. And what he said was that, you know, there wasn't a lot of places that were viable on earth anymore. And that these are the preparations and medicines that the beings on the other side gave the information to that he would create the eight agricult agricultural lectures, right, for biodynamics. Because the right. thing is, is that Steiner, that wasn't his thing, you know. And then he gave the eight agricultural lectures to the Anthroposophy Society, which was the Theosophy Society that morphed into the Anthroposophy Society where they moved more into nutrition and soil and food and seeds. Um, and there was a piece of that. Bridget, I was going to say, just uh, for viewers, just so that you don't get anxious, um, we're going to, after we're done recording this, I, I will put a link for the playlist in the description below. Uh, that way, if any of this is resonating with you, you can just click on that and bookmark it. But just to give you an idea of the breadth and depth and um, Dr. Lenny, I just sometimes I wish, oh my gosh, I wish I would have seen this a year ago with uh, our time doing the new way. But um, I was the, I'm talking just, to you guys about it back then. No, I, I know. <laughs> and I wrote, I wrote down his name, but there was always so many things. There was so much. And that's, that's, that's part of the problem today is the digital age is distraction. There's stimulus coming at you from everywhere. But um, at any rate, I finally got around to it or, or whatever. You know, it's be better late than ever. But just to echo what you were saying, um, I mean, I'll just, I'm not going to read all 240, but I'm just scrolling down this list. And so uh, let me just... Uh, Karmic relationships is one. Intuitive thinking as a spiritual path. Rethinking economics. Um, yeah, that's associative. So now they have a word for that. It's called associative economics. And actually, well, that's there's a there's actually a business online that is actually one of the only ones that have crafted it in the work of Steiner, and it's called Frego World. And they and, are the ones that are carrying out Steiner's economic work. The only ones, actually. Right. And that's what I'm saying is, like, there's stuff on here that's missed that Dr. Lenny and I have actually kind of seen a um, a relationship. And there's roots of it. Let, let me continue with education of the child, a modern art of education, uh, revamping uh Education and academics are the future. Mystics after modernism. So you can see there's a wide range. And then the yeah. outline of esoteric science. Yep, yep. Truth and so knowledge. this is the thing is, so Rudolf Steiner's work branched off into all kinds of different branches. I think the people that were alive, you know, that listened to his stuff and took it in the directions that they did. That's kind of like my feeling. But that's where Waldorf comes from, is Steiner. Um, you know, when you can go to the farm and you can buy into CSA boxes once a week, that's, that's Steiner's work, community, um, you know, uh, you pay it forward to the farmer and, and at first and then you get a box of the goods after. So it's about, you know, kind of like barter and trade type commerce, right? You support to get. Um, supported agriculture. Mm -hmm. And then there's, I mean, everything, health, the number one thing that that um <laughs> how the spiritual me. world projects into physical existence yeah no, that is a five-hour audio book right there some of his stuff just blows your face so far off even going back and studying the eight agricultural lectures by steiner this week is my third one for my certification course yeah and going back and reading it and reading the words that he said and then putting it all into context you know kind of mm -hmm. into now and all this other stuff it's like i leave that class with my lid peeled back because it's so incredible, like the information. I tell people I'm not a culty. There are Steiner culty people that are, I don't do culty. Um, well, uh, because uh, they can we have very culty actually in the modern day age. And it, there's a little bit of Nazism involved sometimes in some of these Waldorf schools we as well. 
you have to also look in context of the, the day and era. Before World War II, some of these ideas were, I mean, there was propaganda at the time that made it that that was a norm. You yeah. know, the Marxism, the the Nazism, the, and that it was a good thing. And uh, I would defer back to you, Dr. Lenny. Um, you always talk about generations every 20 years and how words take on conjure up new meaning and uh, i mean there were there were arguments breaking out on chat uh today earlier on a server and and i'm like whoa everybody every i can tell like there's like three different generations here and everyone's working from a different base understanding let's all agree to what we're actually dis discussing and not assume that socialism you know, means to this person that it means to you because how you define it and understand it based on what your experience and exposure has been to it is going to be different for every person. But and yeah, but we, in, we, in Waldorf schools, I've seen Nazism. Like, like doesn't matter what generation it is, it, it is pure Nazism. Like a white supremacy, um, you know, women's place in the world, just a lot of, you know, you can see it kind of in the school. Um, and, uh, because it's an alternative because Waldorf, if you get certified to be a Waldorf teacher, it's a specialty teacher. You have your students through the whole way, through their whole growth, all the way up. Okay. Um, but what, but what would the school have if these, if these intellectuals were in their prime post World War II? I don't think that they would have these titles. That's what I'm saying. Like I. You know, I haven't been to the schools you have. It's just that uh, I, I've been reading a lot of stuff from the 19th century, especially late 19th century, early 20th century. And, and it's only been through reading newspaper articles uh, via newspapers.com, going back to that point in time. And just looking like at various cities and stuff, uh, you can tell by reading the newspapers that, that it just, it was a different, I, I'm not condoning uh, any of the isms, okay? I'm just saying that at that time, it, some words were appropriate, like in, in psychology, psychiatry. If you had an IQ of 80 or below, that was imbecile. I, I shudder at the thought of ever calling anybody an imbecile. Um, eventually, it, it turned into moron, and then it evolved into... Okay, the, so like, I, have a, I have a question. So what would be... In, in the modern OK language, what, what would be um, Nazism or white supremacy or entitlement? What, no, what I don't think you call that in society a, now. I, I, I'm not saying that that's OK at all. I just am saying that we have to remember the context in which some of these people, the, at the time of the origin, where it was propagandized to them as um like a positive thing and right. go ahead lenny there's something else going on here also and it has to do with our friends the tartarians and the basis for what history is changed completely after world war ii it's like they yeah. scrubbed everything that was done in the 20th century or in the yeah, in the 20th century prior to the wars and things that were good thought beforehand were now not talked about and erased from the whole time period. So we've been given a very, very structured history that may not be correct. I wonder if Steiner knew people like Edgar Casey or Alan Watts or if those guys were both after Steiner. After but, they were, yeah, somebody like Walter Russell might have been. I'd like, uh, I I shuddered to even look at anything that had the word occult on it. I am forty six years old, and it is only in this year, two thousand nineteen, that I learned occult means hidden. And I was like, well, hidden isn't that's scary. I mean, depending yeah. on what you're hiding. And so otherwise it, it was, you know what I mean? Like it was a wall. Like I'm not even looking at that. That's, that's, 
that's isms, that's devil stuff, that's the wrong direction. But it would be, it, we have to do our due diligence in looking at this information that's been compiled during their era. And a cult didn't have the, the negative spin on it during their time as it does now. Yeah, yeah. No, this, and also I just want you to know that this is just a great conversation. So really like the conversation where it's going tonight um, <clears throat> from different kinds of sides. But well, Lenny's like chomping at the bit over here. He's like repositioned himself. So we better let him talk because his mind, his little rat on his wheel is thinking, I can tell. Okay, Lenny, go. Actually, I was just going to get another set of pens because my pen ran out as I was taking notes. But there's a lot of different approaches that we're going to be taking with this Think Collaborative. And I really think that what we can do is have a different person in the lead every Sunday evening talking about the things that they're interested in. And as we grow the group, we should interview each other and get the backgrounds so that as we build, people can see the collective coming together using good group theory. Each of us has learned to be a group of one and master our own time frame. And then we have to learn to be a group of one and master the human scale. And it's only after we have human scale and what we want as an individual that we can combine into groups of two and three and five and work together from a point of knowledge rather than assembling a group that works together based on the education system and doesn't really have a first-hand understanding from being immersed. So a lot of my work is going to be coming together with the theory and then developing scripts so that we can role play ourselves in the, uh, as actors in roles and then come back and analyze what we said and what we did in the role and see if that is really acceptable human behavior for moving forward beyond this capitalist system, which isn't going to be here much longer. Yeah, well, hopefully it's not going to be here much longer. Anyway, I wanted to say something to Karen. So the, Karen, this is kind of like how different, you know, our upbringing was. And so just put this out there for people. This is why we all, no matter where we're coming from, really need to come together and actually have conversations because we start to find out that we're more alike than not when yeah. it comes down to it. But when I was growing up, I was skeptical and nervous about things in organized religion. I was led to believe that those, that you had to be really careful with those, some of those ideas and belief systems. And so I was encouraged to read stuff so far out of the box. I mean, when I was 14, I was reading Carlo Castaneda's work. I was reading um, Seth, uh, the Jane Roberts book, Seth. Who she oh my gosh, I just read that last week. Oh my gosh. So she has a whole bunch of yeah, yes. she has a whole bunch of those um, actually books. There's quite a few. I think there's like six or something like that, maybe 10. But anyway, I still have all the original ones like in my storage uh, from when um, when I was young. And so I read all kinds of um, stuff that I could get my hands on and things that I could find that were occulty, you know, because it was like for me growing up, the more I could know about maybe people that were more like myself, you know what I mean, was extremely helpful. And I didn't have anybody in my family saying, oh, you can't read that, or you can't have that, or where did you get that? You know, nothing was ever wow. said. Yeah, and and I grew up in a family where my great-grandmother was the only, on my mom's side, was the only one that actually had a formal education. So pretty much probably at this point in time, I have a, a huge education background compared to pretty much probably everyone in my family on my mom's side um so but it's interesting you know when you're like oh a cult would be like a horrific thing you know in my world um you know anything super natural was like welcome and it was like the natural state anyway I just no the word supernatural uh wouldn't scare me but the word occult 
I conjures up and until I open my eyes in the last year or so, um, it conjured up images of uh, if you're reading an occult book, anything with the word occult in the title of the book, it meant that you were reading something about trying to do dark, something with black, the devil. devilish, <laughs> mass, mass, witchcraft. Yeah. 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 witchcraft. Well, why do you, so can I ask you a question, Karen, not to put you on the, you know, hot spot, but, um, so where do you think that you, you learned that? Where do you think that it came from? Like seeing um, horror movies or things projected onto horror movies? Or no, it religion? definitely came from my Catholic upbringing. Oh, and oh, Catholic. Oh, there you go. Yeah, my mom would not, because of what happened to her in Catholic school, she would not enroll us in Catholic school. So we were in public school, but we had to go to CCD. And um, it just, it was very strict and you memorize the Ten Commandments and they took the whole class. I mean, I just, I just remember going to like confessionals and saying, um, I borrowed Dottie Connor's pen and I didn't give it back. So I think I stole it. <laughs> wow, that is so harsh. Oh, Karen, I wish I was there to give you a hug, girl. Oh, that is horrible. Oh, oh my God. Catholic is uh, Jewish with Jesus. Oh, that's right. You are <laughs> Jewish. Oh, yeah. That's a whole. Linny and I have had conversations about his upbringing <laughs> and kind of how it kind of scarred him. Because didn't it? Didn't you tell me not to put Linny on the spot? But didn't you tell me that it when you grew up you kind of hated not or you were kind of led to kind of dislike other cultures or people that were non-Jewish? I mean. How did you tell, formulate that? That's kind of like what I the take I got from it. It's from kind our conversation. That the Jewish people feel that they are the chosen people biblically, and so therefore everyone else is not good enough to associate in their world, and so they have one set of rules for Jewish and another different set of rules for Gentiles. But they don't necessarily follow their own rules. And so every religion has their own stuff that they deal with. But the Jewish religion sort of deals with their own in an exclusive way. And I think a lot of the world problems that we're dealing with now, a lot of people point at the Jewish religion as the cause of the problems. And I think that's really a simplistic approach that it's all organized monotheistic religions that have created a problem in having a vengeful god whereas mm -hmm. i'm not sure what the gods are but they're definitely not anything that we as humans can know to speak of right it's as simplified as uh, a lone wolf uh killed jfk you know um, it's the same thing. Oversimplifying yeah. and generalizing is 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 danger. It, that that's what leads to ignorance. And but you know it's interesting because uh, you know growing up in my household it did the normal like out of the house at eighteen straight to college. If I ever, I, I, we could not miss mass. I mean, that just was a no. The, if, if you did not go to mass, I mean, of course you had to, like, when, but when I got, like, older, like, 14, 15, 16, if you did not go to mass, if you complained, I want to sleep in, no, you have to go to mass or you choose mass or you're grounded the entire week. Well, of course, I'm going to mass. And, and so I just, it, it didn't, it just, it was, it just didn't speak to me. All right. And I, I just assumed that I saw that it was very important to my parents uh, and my, the families in my community. And I just went along to get along. But then as soon as I was in college, I go down to the Bible Belt. I'm at Clemson University in South Carolina. And that's a whole different type of Christianity. And it, they're like, oh, you're Catholic? And I'm like, everybody I know in Pittsburgh's Catholic. Like, they're Catholic or Jewish, you know? Um, I just, I didn't, 
and but there was this you know assembly of god like pentecostal um these fellowships and it it was kind of like really like tammy faye baker jimmy baker type and so i was like wow this is really a turnoff because it seems like a hypocrisy but whatever i really just observed i just was keeping an open mind and i i completely denounced uh catholicism uh when uh basically i I got a divorce because of a um I, i was lied to and there was all kinds of fraudulent things going on and that kind of thing and i just came to a place where it's like i refuse to think that i need i'm i need to be shamed at church every week and why is she sitting down not getting communion what what did she do you know like the scarlet letter or whatever i refuse to think that like me who's a good person i'm not perfect i you know but i'm a good person i refuse to think that God is going to send me to hell because I got a divorce. I just, I don't think that's going to happen. So I just kind of was like, I guess the best thing to do is familiarize myself with all the religions. (laughs) (laughs) And then I kind of found truth in every single one. And I, I I, just like with theories in psychology, I, I can't subscribe to one ther- theoretical framework, and and that's the be all end all. Our environment well, I, and people are too complicated for that. Yeah, well, the thing is, we're multifaceted. We are. <clears throat> we have some physical traits, multidimensional traits, all kinds of different traits. We have a mental trait, emotional trait. I mean, in some some philosophies, they in shamanism, we look at the end of person. As having eight bodies. That's that's complicated to adhere to one system of belief, you know, that this is the be all end all. Anyway, just kind of my two cents. Yeah. What were you going to say, Dr. Lenny? It seems to me that religion is evolving even as we're speaking, and that the elderly people were very much serious and trained within their religions. As we get younger and younger, the religious training was more an indoctrination than an understanding, and so people don't comprehend what's expected. They just listen to the platitudes of the priest and follow what they say, whereas what we need to do personally is take responsibility for ourselves and run from it there so by gathering experience in the first person we become more emotive we can have empathy for other people and we're not called on to the strict judgments that religion enforces upon people yeah think about people who had to leave like religions long ago that were really strict in regime you know Mm -hmm. and this is other thing one thing that i recently learned about the um you know like middle eastern traditions where women wear are covered and have different types of way that some some women are like completely covered and just have like an eye window you know to look out but that stuff actually started up in the 70s i was talking to somebody from like iraq and iran and they said you know like those countries were some of the wealthiest countries over there syria was this had some of the top universities on earth that had a collective of thinking. I mean, because this is where math came from, was this part of the world, right? The Arabic uh, people created math, supposedly, right? So, um, but then when they started, they started going after those areas, you know, we can say the cabal, Illuminati, you know, people involved with the U.S. government, and they started to go after those cultures. They were showing me pictures where all the women were in bikinis on the beach, you know, like in Iran. And that there was wealth and people went to university and it was a lot more open culture. And then about the 70s, they started transitioning into this very hardcore 
um, control, uh, terrifying um, type of, uh, you know, religious systems that are going on now, you know, especially with the ones women have to cover themselves all up. So this is kind of like this covering of the women and a lot of the stuff that's going on over there is relatively actually new. Which is a trip for me. You know, having looked at the photos and stuff like that, you know, and how hard it would be. Um, I mean, at this point, you know, if you choose to like not go along with it, I mean, they can murder you, <laughs> you know, that you find yourself stoned to death or whatever else, or if you have to flee the country away from your family to try to, you know, obtain a different kind of life that's more open for you, that would take just so much courage on so many levels. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I don't think I want to go to the Middle East anytime soon. I almost, I almost accepted a job. I used. I almost accepted a job there in Qatar at Sidri Medical in 2015. Do you think you could have worn like a a full? What is it? A hajib? Is that the whole thing, or is that just the head part? Oh, I would totally embrace the culture and and totally. But it wasn't even like that. I mean, as I went through the interview process, I mean. The expats, they they have their own housing and they have transportation to pick you up. And because you're Western um, working there, uh, you don't have to adhere to their cultural things. And women from, you know, Canada, the UK, whatever, they also are allowed to get driver's license. However, um, some one of my neighbors was very concerned that I was even entertaining this. And she said, you know, my daughter was over there. Um, I want to put you in touch. And she said, you, you know, you have to make an informed decision. And she put me in touch with a doctor that was actually working out of that um, a, a nearby facility. I mean, because Sidri was a maternal a level one maternal child that hadn't even opened up yet. Um, but and, and so she gave me the lowdown and um, she said, you wouldn't want to get a driver's license here because it's like crazy. And um, she indicated that, um, yeah, it's you, you, you can dress like you do, you know, in America, but you stand out obviously as Western. And if you, you even like go to the a pub or something to get a drink and, you know, have a lifestyle that you're used to, uh, you cannot be alone. You need to be in a big group because um, there's so many um men that uh, are looking for a good time and there's an assumption that all, all women of the West are wild, loose, and fancy free, I guess. So, and that wasn't as bothersome as, for me, ultimately, uh, I was hoping to get out of all the regulations that our, our social system was putting and restricting uh, our healthcare workers. That's that's the large reason why nurses, doctors, expats are attracted to Middle East positions. Um, but I think I was only going to be trading more for the same. I think there were going to be, there was going to be, from what I was hearing, we don't have like Medicare regulations at Guitar, right? So there's more freedom to to just practice good old fashioned social work. But there's different um culturally culturally backed agendas that you kind of have to adhere to or risk you know going to the principal's office as i call it and um there was apparently there's a population over there that um is almost unable to be helped because um i guess they're inbred and obviously the you know they're that part is not what what we see on a global scale. Of course, they show the best parts of their their country, right? Um, and so I didn't even know about this in any of the research I did. So these this um, these and I don't remember what they call them, but they're just largely inbred, and there's there's an, an obvious divide between the wealthy and these 
you know, I wouldn't even call them commoners. The way it was referred to and explained to me was just that it was like they were they almost were like outcasts. They were well, still like regarded as human, but that, you know, and yeah. so the psychiatrist was just like, um, so basically I get all these people and they're like, fix them, like basically fix them to be like us, but there's no resources and she's like, I think it probably would be worse being a social worker over here than it would be being a psychiatrist. She's like, because literally there would be no resources for you to connect them to. And that's what they're going to expect you to do. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Um, okay, thanks. I'm glad I talked to you. <laughs> No, I have this story, and I just want to put it out there. We're putting this up on the YouTube channel, and, and this is part of what our channel is doing. We're having discussions about things, right, coming from different places so that we can kind of get a, a better re-education on it. So these co-labs that we're having, cooperative labs, live labs, <clears throat> that we'll be putting up when we have time, we'll be talking about a lot of things that you know may upset people so i just want to say that we are not at all trying to um, culturally diversify politically diversify medically diversify what we're trying to do is actually bring information that we have experienced and learned and all these different things and you know to the now so that we can help other people if other people choose to open their minds right so um so please don't hate us. <laughs> well, I second what you just said. Um, and you have to realize that this is obviously one directional. You're, you're listening and we're not actually having a back and forth conversation. And I even noticed in uh, just regular text chat without the voice, sometimes if you can't go back and forth and clarify, it, it could very well be that you both share the same value and, and value the same principles, but it's just that you may have different words or, or different angles by which you arrive at that. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's a good disclaimer. Yeah, so I was prefacing that because I have a story that I was going to tell too. To add on to your story, you know, of, of what's going on in the Middle East and potentially going there. So I knew this guy who was kind of high up in some special forces in the military. And so he got a station position out in the middle of the desert on this hill, right? And they had this place where, you know, there was a few of them there. It was supposed to be like a U.S. secret location. And they basically, he he thought it was going to be like this big deal because he's special ops and they're calling him in for the special job for six months. And so he's thinking it's going to be like enormous, you know, kind of, you know, in his mind. So what happens is that him and like a couple other guys, they would work in like 24 hour shifts together. Uh, I think like two or three of them. And so their job basically was to be at this lookout point with like, you know, night goggles looking down at the, um, there was not a fortress, but there was a, um, you know, a village, but it was, it was one family, one giant family village, right? And so they're being asked to like watch this guy and all the family members and the ones that are coming and going, this is in Afghanistan. And the ones that are coming and going and then come back and how many actually live on the property and who are they, who are they married to and all this other stuff. So they're thinking like this guy is got to be like major Al Qaeda or something, you know, so that they have to watch him 24 seven actually take notes. Right. And that all these notes they'll they'll send in and they'll be looked at and all this other stuff. Well, he said it got to where um, it was like the most res ridiculous thing that he really ever did in the military and basically it was a giant family um and it was pretty inbred -y. and he said basically his logs and so i don't want people to get all like upset out there but he said basically his logs would be like um there was the head guy of the whole family right there's the head one that you know dictates all the stuff there are periods where the men all go together and then they dictate everything that's going on but he said you know head guy gets up 4 a.m you know um humps goat goes back oh, in house boy then he'd see him the course of the day and he said basically all the guy did was 
eat and hump everyone. Hump his grandkids, hump wives, hump cousins, hump animals. Like in the course of his day, he'd have meetings with the family, but it basically that's all he did was eat and hump things. And this guy and his the other guy that was with him literally had to watch. Um, you know. Well, I can only imagine what that would do to his mind. It it he's like he said it was the worst part of his whole military career six years that I mean he and that was it after that he quit the military he was like yeah not staying it any longer in case I may have to survive something like that again but, but see I, that's that's just thing I mean like okay so maybe in that village that's the norm all right that that's fine well but, no but it was one family village so there was like 150 people that were right. connected to the whole thing and I think quite a few actually live there right and so but the thing is is if if they're ostracized from the rest of the parts of the society there's no blending of and sharing and assimilation of different codes of behavior right yeah yeah totally. and, and and so if they're and from what I was being told by this psychiatrist is that um that I guess structurally with housing and things like that that they force them out of sight but obviously when it comes to I need care let's say I've been sexually assaulted by you know, somebody in my family village or whatever, obviously you, you can't deny them care. So ultimately it falls in the laps of the mental health professional of, oh yes. Um, it, okay. But if, if the country isn't set up structurally where, you know, there's counseling for domestic violence and shelters for domestic violence, or, I mean, forget that you got to go way back. You have to go back to, well, I mean, well, people can't even get help for it in the United States. I mean, those poor women out there, they have no choice. I mean, they can't tell anybody anything's happening. And they may even have like four kids that are like their grandfathers, you know. But for them, like it probably goes back further than that. Like if I was having a conversation with that, those women, I, I'd probably have to go back to you know, let's get go to basics. Let's not talk about what's right or wrong or what other people tell you are right and wrong. Teach me about you. What do you think is right or wrong? And if, if and I had this actually in Brazil. And um, ab the word abuse in Brazil means sexual abuse only. They don't recognize physical abuse, psychological abuse. And literally the conversation has to go down this whole thing of like, so, so in your belief system, it's okay t to be hit, punched, uh, psychologically manipulated, or um, be controlled uh, financially to the point you're scared that you, you know, you're literally dependent on this person and they can treat you however. Say, okay, so you think that's right because it's tolerated by your larger culture. Let me ask you now a different question. It's not about right or wrong. How does it feel? You know, and, and, and a lot of times they, in that situation, they're not in touch with their feelings because, I mean, if you're in that situation and there's no outlet and the, the way the culture is structured is there are no alternatives, you just, this is, this is my lot in my life. This is as good as it gets. Uh, you know, I mean, they literally, literally, I talked to women, and this is, was in 2006. I, they did not think that, they thought that it was right, that a man has a right, you know, in a married situation. And um, so, you know, I got an education. I was like, wow. I'm so, um, I just want to say that I'm so glad that you're coming out of your closet. My closet? <laughs> Yeah, that you're like coming out of the closet and you're talking a lot more about what you know and your experiences and yeah, I love because I'm heal I'm healing. Um, yeah. I I think I couldn't talk about it for a long time because honestly, the system traumatized me. 
because here I am with this huge caring heart and really want to help, but you don't really want me to help and you really don't want me to empower people and you really don't want me to advocate for people. And then you get pissed off when I make them aware of what their rights are and when they assert their rights and they end up staying a couple more days in the hospital or whatever, or they end up having to be admitted because, you know, there's a liability at risk or whatever. It's just like that pesky, you know, social worker, you know, like Scooby-Doo, like what do they always say? If it wasn't for those pesky, nosy kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying that I like I like the new you. I like the new you a lot. The well, this is, the origi- this is the original me. Yeah, the <laughs> Actually, <coming> <laughs> I like this it. This is the original. Thank you. I love it. I love all your stories. I love your experience. Okay, Lenny, tell us something. Do we have, okay, so everybody, do we have anything in closing? To tie it all up, any thoughts? Yeah, I think the system transforms people and that it gives the specific wrong message and rewards behaviors that we find most hard. And that to get out of the system as it currently exists, we need to develop new systems that are alternatives. But currently, we have a one-size-fits-all system, and it's not functioning very well, and there's no alternative to move off to. So unless we can develop some new alternatives, we're going to have to teach people how to grow their own food and how to purify their own water and how to do things that are inclusive in the micro scale and let the macro scale fall apart without being attached to it because there's no way of fixing it. There's no fix in the system anymore. Right. Okay, right. Any, any closing thoughts for you? And I just want people to know we have, I don't know, I'm going to call it the, so we have somebody who has a Jewish background, a heavy Jewish background. We have somebody who had a, a you know, a heavy Catholic background and me, who had a pretty heavy, I don't know, a cultist background, but we're all getting along. So these are the key things that we want our YouTube channel people to see, that we can have intense conversations and we can get along and we can work together. That's my last thing in closing, but go ahead, Karen, if you have anything for closing. No, I just, just, just like think collaborative. This is what this is for we're thinking, we're thinking out loud, we're brainstorming. It's a think tank because there is, there is such a dire need for a different way. And, you know, not saying that we're going to come up with solutions, but by talking about it, um, we're opening the conversation, maybe helping some of the viewers um, open the conversation or join the conversation. And, um, you know, maybe the right merge and confluence of, of the right people and the right ideas and the right resources and, and, and it, it'll it'll get better but not not if we're pitted against one another not if we're afraid um that kind of thing so and not if we stay silent that silence is yes deadly yeah right okay lenny you're any closing last mementos I think that what we'll end up doing is bringing more people into our collaborative and having them join us on our Sunday night conversations. And gradually we will mix and match the groups so that everybody's opinions get heard and we have perspective from all 360 degrees in the circle. So I'm very excited about what we're doing. We're just starting. All right, everybody. Um, you guys stay on. I'm going to quit the record. Um, okay. All right, over and, you, buddy. Over this and is, out. This is your yep. weekly cooperative lab, co lab, <laughs> on the <laughs> Think Collaborative. <laughs>